maybe I should introduce myself um, since we've been doing lots of introductions. Um, I am a researcher. I'm not an academic. I'm not quite sure what the distinction is, but I'm not. Um, and uh, I think it's because I, so I, I only work on, I work on whatever projects I want to work on, providing I can get money for them. So I don't, ha I don't have like a tenured, you know, I, I haven't got like a permanent contract as an academic and means I don't have to teach um, if I don't want to. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, maybe just that one. I it doesn't yeah. need to be super dark. Right. Um, yeah, so, um, and, and the way that I got into this, um, so I work at the Stockholm Environment Institute at the University of York, um, and basically we are a, we're in a, in a research organisation that does environment and development um, uh, projects all across the world, so our head office is in Stockholm, hence the name. I haven't come from Stockholm today, um, I've come from York. And um, basically we really try to link together scientific research um, and policy. Um, so we're trying to do research that makes, makes a difference, basically, in the kind of shorthand. Um, and I got into this work because I did a, my degree was in geography. And it was a mixture of human geography and physical geography. And so it was really, um, it was the bits that interaction, so it's like the bits between the humans and the environment that really, really interested me. And my then boyfriend, now husband, um, was doing a degree in biology at York. And I was really interested in all the ecology and the natural world stuff that he was learning about, far more interested actually in that than he was interested in that. And so when it got to the end of my degree, I thought I'm going to move in with Chris in York and I'm going to um, do a Masters in Biodiversity and Conservation at Leeds. And um, I did and I loved it and I was doing it part time um, because I couldn't afford the fees full time. So in my rest of my time I was working at doing an admin job at York Hospital which was the most boring job I've ever done and um, my boss was a bit of a nightmare and she was a control freak um, and she'd sort of give me tasks to do and then would come back in at the end of the day and like say well I didn't want you to do it like that and stop, you know it was just a complete waste of time and my job really was to make a newsletter um, once a month, answer the phone and um, check emails and open the post and I got five emails a day, the phone rang probably once a day and the post only came once a day. So I spent a lot of time actually sleeping on my keyboard um, and uh, I'd wake up in because it was a really lovely sunny office and I'd wake up in the afternoon with like a key print on my face. So in order to keep myself sane whilst I was doing this I started volunteering for a charity um, that was then called the British Trust for Conservation Volunteers and is now the Conservation Volunteers and they do um, practical conservation in the UK but they also do environmental education and so I started doing uh, one day a week um, volunteering for them for two years during my masters um, and was loving going out and talking to kids, adults, people of all ages about the natural world um, and then this job came up working at the Stockholm Environment Institute um, on this project, the Opal project, um, and basically they wanted somebody to talk, go out and talk to local communities about nature, about the natural world, um, to learn together about um, what you know what the state of the environment was basically. Um, so it's a really big national project um, that's been running since 2008, and I've been working there since then. Um, and basically, yes, yeah, it's, it's trying to. Um, sort of reconnect people sounds a bit patronising, but so many people in the UK are disconnected from the natural environment, so um, it's trying to sort of, um, yeah, for some people reconnect them with the natural environment, but also just kind of together to learn more about the state of the natural environment. Um, and um, yeah, so we got a huge amount of money, £14 million, pounds, um, over five years from the big lottery fund and to work in England, and now we've expanded to the rest of the UK. Um, and I wanted to talk to you about this today because it's, for me, it's really about forming relationships between academics um, and community members um, because it's a citizen science project. Now, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this term, but basically citizen science is um, where volunteers or 
uh, participants or members of the public partner with scientists um, to answer real world scientific questions. Um, so, um, examples of this would be um, probably the most famous in the UK is the RSPB's Big Garden Bird Watch. So, people go out and um, on a weekend in January and they record all the birds that they see in their gardens. Um, the, one of the issues with um, that these kinds of projects is that they have a very particular demographic who take part in them. So um, for the RSPB's Garden Birdwatch and the British Trust for Ornithology's um, Garden Birdwatch, um, all of their data comes from people who live in the southeast of England and are white and middle class. Um, and so what, they were what we were trying to do within the OPAL project was trying to work with people who don't normally engage with the natural environment. Um, and there's three types of citizen science projects. So there's these ones which are like contributory, which is basically scientists go, right, people, I've got some data that I would like to be collected about birds or about beetles or about space or whatever, um, and I'd like you to go and collect my data for me. This is the way you do it. Um, and then you have more collaborative projects, which is where um, scientists perhaps come up with the idea that they want to find out about, but they talk to people and say, hey, could we help design the methods together? Or would you like to help with analysing data or communicating findings or whatever? And then co-created projects are really much more sort of bottom-up and truly participatory, where it's more like people working together and saying, hey, we've got a question about the natural world that we'd like, um, we'd like to work with you on. Um, and projects can be sort of more education focused, so it's about educating people, or they can be more scientific, so like um, actually we just want to create, we want to collect data about space or whatever over a massive area. Um, so that's just a bit of background on citizen science, and so I just wanted to show you a few of the diverse citizen science projects that are out there, because I'm aware that you might not have come across these, this type of stuff before. So this is quite an old one, Herbaria at Home, and um, this is run by the Botanical Society of the British Isles, um, and the BSBI is a very old natural history society in the UK, and they've got um, all of these, what we call Herbaria sheets, so these are muse in museums and they're basically a specimen of that plant um, and it tells you like who collected it, where it was collected from, the features of it, what its name, the name of the species and everything. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to get people to, they're taking photographs of these things and they're trying to get people to transcribe the information that is on those sheets and so then you can find out more about where different plants were found. So it's digitising basically this information that is previously just found in museums. So that's one example. Um, Galaxy Zoo, I don't know if anyone's heard of this, but this is a massive citizen science project run by the Zooniverse team. Um, and this is basically where they've got pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope and they're getting people to classify galaxies on which way they're spinning. Um, I don't understand it anything more than that. It's, it's like way, way out of my comfort zone. But it's something to do with expansion of space. And the galaxy spinning tells you what the, I don't know the way the galaxy galaxy is expanding, but they've now they do all sorts of things like this, and it, this is a very um, very much on the end of crowdsourcing kind of projects. So this is basically like here are some images, people. We would like you to help us classify them. So they do stuff like um, put up. There's one called penguin watch and you have to you get loads of pictures of penguins and you have to say how many penguins are in each picture um, and they have millions of participants across the world um, taking part in these projects and I sort of started off sort of just being involved and I was on our April project we were designing surveys that people could do of their local environment so we did our first one was all about soil and earthworms so we got people to look at different species of worm that they found in their back garden and um, because there aren't just big worms and small worms in the UK we have 27 different species of earthworm in the UK um, in France they have 103 I can talk more about that over dinner if anyone would like to. Um, but um, so, so we were talking to people about these kind of things and saying, you know, there's stuff that you can look at anywhere. Nature is everywhere. You don't have to go to some amazing highland space or whatever to look at these amazing things. There are some on your doorstep. So I started off sort of just doing these kind of projects and setting them up and working with communities. Um, and now I'm actually going, well, what do people get out of this? 
Like, we're getting data that's collected over a really wide area, but what do the people get out of it? Why do people take part in these kind of projects? Um, what benefits do people get from it? And there are some real issues with this kind of thing. So, for example, um, my brother-in-law works for the Environment Agency, um, so they are responsible for... Um, sort of maintaining waterways, groundwater sources and things like that in the UK. And he was saying, oh yeah, we had an article about citizen science in our environment agency newsletter. Um, and he was like, yeah, we're going to get members of the public to um, do all this work that we can't afford to do anymore. So we're going to get people to go around and measure, like, um, they have these dip wells which show how much water there is um, in, like, certain places across, um, across the UK. And it's a really intensive job to go out and measure the water table depths in all of these dip wells. Um, but he was like, yeah, so they were saying that they're going to get people to do that. And they're going to have it so that there's a little sign next to it which says, hello, could you text us the details of you know, what it says on this dip well? And I said to him, why would people do that? Like, why, you know, why would people do that? And he was like, oh, because they, you know, I think the thinking is they'll see a sign and they'll think that's a good thing to do. And my research, I've done a bit of research on this, and some people are motivated to take part in these projects because they do want to help science, you know. There's this kind of thing out there that they want to advance. But other people are motivated by loads of different reasons. So they want to take part in these kind of projects because they really like classifying things or they want to take part in these projects because they like meeting people or, you know, they, they like the sort of community forming aspects or whatever. And you need to, when you're designing these projects, you need to take into account the fact that at least you need to give people feedback because the Environment Agency are saying, wow, this will be great, we can have this army of volunteers who go and collect all this data for us and they think it's just going to all start flooding in. And then what happens? What happens to that data, you know? It's going to be collected. No, they're never going to get any feedback. Thank you very much. This has helped us do X, Y, and Z. So, yeah, so I'm now thinking that there's kind of... It, it's not... Lots of people are now... This is such a popular thing. Citizen science is massive now. Um, and... Um, it's, um, I guess what I'm saying is it's not like some sort of panacea for all of our austerity problems. You know, this is not a solution. And it's also not very participatory. Like, a lot of what this is is not participatory at all. And within um, universities, there's this real push for public engagement and impact. Yeah, we're all being measured on impact and how many people we've spoken to and, you know, what, how we've changed people's lives, right? You know, that's, this is what we're being measured on. Um, and this is really problematic because I'm going out and saying, oh, well, I've sp spoken to 100 people about earthworms this month, but I have no idea whether that's going to make any difference to their lives or anything like that. So I wanted to give you a little example of a project that is um, a little bit more... Um, it's a little bit more participatory, so I wanted to talk to you about a project that I've been working on um, in Yorkshire. Um, and it's, um, I'm really pleased that I chose this example because it's about ex-mining sites. So obviously it fits in with some of the things that we've been talking about today. Um, so here is a map of Yorkshire. Um, and this is, there's York where I'm based. Um, and um, this is... Um, the, this is sort of Wakefield and Pontefract um, around here, um, and this is the area that we've been working in. Um, and we've been investigating the effects of basically reclamation methods um, on biodiversity. And this is really important because um, those of you who live in or near these kinds of areas, you'll know that when the mining finished, it was, sometimes sites were just left. You know, and the vegetation just came in naturally and regenerated um, and people sort of reclaimed that space. Um, other sorts of sites were landscaped, so generally when they were building like a housing estate or something nearby, they'd take all the clay um, off from wherever it was they were building the housing estate, dump it on top of these sometimes really nicely naturally regenerating sites, turn it into golf courses. Um, or plan to turn into golf courses, which is the two sites we were working on. So we were working on Upton and Fitzwilliam country parks. Um, both areas suffer from quite high levels of rural deprivation, um, high unemployment and low educational attainment, um, basically because these are mining villages, and when the mines closed, 
um, not only did um, the men um, lose all the mining jobs, but the women who were doing all the supporting industry also lost all of their employment too. Um, so Fitzwilliam, um, this one here, was landscaped as a golf course. So they, I don't know who they thought was going to come and play golf here. It's not exactly something that the locals um, were doing um, in their spare time. But anyway, so they re landscaped as a golf course. And um, the guy who was, who, who was a big golf fan in the, um, the council whose plan this was left. And um, somebody else said, you know what, we've got a better idea. Let's turn it into a country park. Um, so now it's a country park, um, and yeah, so you can just about see, I don't know if you can see this actually, but this is Fitzwilliam um, Village here, um, and this is the country park, and you can kind of see the fairways like laid out, so it's still got this golf, this golf course legacy, um, and um, yeah, and Upton um, is, was... This is quite a nice, this is a really lovely site actually, and it's quite interesting here, working here because it was very much the heart of the village, and so we found that going out and trying to recruit people to take part in our project was so much easier at Upton, because people were walking through the site um, on their way to the school or the library, which is sadly now closed, um, but yeah, so people were walking through the site, and they'd see me, um, a couple of my students, in our hoodies saying Opal, explore nature, and they'd see our car in the car park saying explore nature, and they were like, what the hell are you doing here? Like, why have you come from the University of York to our little village? Um, and that was really interesting because as a, as a southern, so you might be able to detect from my accent, I'm not native to Yorkshire, so I was a posh southern girl who was an academic, who you know doesn't necessarily fit the stereotype of a scientist, coming and working on a site that was in their village, actually that gave me a really privileged position because people thought, well, you're obviously interested enough in our site to be able to come here, so there must be something special about the site. Um, and people really opened up. The council said to us when we started working in these areas, basically... This is you, you aren't going to be able to engage with these people because they've got a pit mentality. Um, you're not going to be able to engage with them. They're not going to be interested in working with you. And, you know, well, how wrong they were. Um, so we, we developed um, some... One of the ways we, we tried to engage people um, in the sites was through um, historic mapping. Um, and this is something that we do a lot of at um, SEI. Um, and basically, we got maps of the area, and we talked. So we got people to talk about what the sites were like um, at, through different eras of time. And we used this to build up a picture of actually what things had been there in the past. So where the pit head was, um, where the brick industry was around it, and that kind of thing. Because that really has helped shape the wildlife that's on site. Because particularly um, at Upton, because it wasn't landscaped, it was just sort of left actually that's really helped influence both the plants that are there but then all the butterflies and the bats and all of the other kind of associated animals along along the way and we found this was a really good way of engaging people who weren't necessarily interested in nature because they were just interested in their local site and the local history um, and it was a really really good way of then talking to people and saying well hey if you're interested in that maybe whilst you're walking your dog or whatever could you perhaps do some butterfly surveys? Or And we did training for people on how to identify butterflies and bumblebees. Um, and dog walkers were absolutely amazing. For I mean, that, they were our main participants. Because they were doing that route. They knew that site really, really well. They were walking around it anyway. And so we just said, you know, could you give us some information while you're doing this? And I had two fantastic master's students who... Um, did Masters by Research, which they got out of all of the data that had been collected by um, the community members. And at Upton now, so yeah, we had 34 volunteers. Um, we did press releases into like the local, par like not really press releases, but the local parish newsletter and things like that, and found that actually sticking up signs in the fish and chip shop was a much better way of um, <laughs> recruiting people because they were the, the places that people went. Um, and the on-site presence of us, literally, people just like, are you here again? <laughs> like, you know, that was, that was really good. Um, and, yeah, so we gave people identification materials. And 
people, some other scientists are sceptical about sometimes about the quality of the data that can be generated through these kind of methods, like because it's not like seen as a traditional way of doing science. Um, but we, one of my students did um, an exercise where he walked the same route as the as the our volunteers at the same time as them, and found that they had almost identical. Um, results. So they were getting really, really high quality data and they were learning about the natural environment and they were most importantly telling us about the natural environment because we were trying to look and see actually how has the different ways that they've reclaimed the site, the natural sort of natural regeneration of the site and the spreading of brick rubble versus the spreading of the clay or whatever, how has this actually influenced the ecology on the site? Because my students were both ecologists and I'm sort of I'm a bit confused about what I am, but I'm also interested in ecology. Um, so we got really high quality data, um, and it, yeah, and, it, and we ended up actually ending up having some really nice um, community relationship building. So, uh, have I talked about that? No, I haven't talked about that. Um, okay, I'll talk about it anyway. So one of the things at Upton, um, so Fitzwilliam we also, we also worked at, um, like I said, it was less successful in terms of, so they already had a friends of group who were looking after the park, um, and um, they were already quite sort of they were they were already quite set in the ways of what they were doing. So it was much harder to engage with them than it was at um, Upton. So Upton didn't have any friends of group, but it did have an angling club, and the fishermen were um, playing a really important community development role because there was a lot of antisocial behaviour happening on site and they were teaching the young people how to fish and basically providing an alternative activity for them than burning bins and um, you know quad biking and all that stuff that they were doing. Um, and so the anglers, we, we sort of started talking to the anglers, the pond is right in the middle of the site, so we were talking to them and working with them and they said to us, well you might be interested in butterflies but we're really interested in invasive crayfish because um, the crayfish, American signal crayfish, are coming here and they're eating our fish. And every time we put our rod in, instead of getting a fish, we get a bloody crayfish out. And um, unfortunately, you're not, well, yeah, you're not really allowed to eat. They're, they're really tasty, but you're not allowed to eat them because they, um, because you can't, have, you, so you can't have a license to catch them because you might accidentally catch this other kind of crayfish, which is a native crayfish, and it's all massively complicated. But we said, well, we're scientists, so we're allowed to get a license to catch crayfish. So we did a project with them where we caught crayfish for them by the hundreds. Um, <laughs> And we did a study looking at, with, so we did a study which we designed with them. They were like interested in, well, where are these bloody crayfish coming from in the pond? So we designed a study where we looked at like how the crayfish lived and where they lived in the pond and how we did a, we looked at how you can eradicate crayfish. You can't, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, we did make a big dent in the population <laughs> over, our, over our study period. Um, so that was a really nice, like, actually collaborative project where we together created this this really nice piece of work and since we left um which again i feel that's that's the trouble with this kind of research when you're given funding for a very specific period of time at some point you have to leave and you have to say especially in my situation because i'm all project funded like i'm now working on totally different things so i had to kind of say right guys um you know you've been great knowing you but now I have to go on and do other things um, but the, the group that we've been working with the individuals that we've been working with formed a group and are now have formed a friends of the country park um, and are looking after it are doing tree planting exercises of doing path maintenance all this kind of thing and that's because before it was just like one individual man walking around with his dog and looking at butterflies and now they realise that there are other people who like walking their dogs and looking at butterflies at the same time. Um, so it's actually had a really nice positive impact. So although I started off quite negative about these kind of projects, I think you can have some real, you can, you can have some really nice changes taking place, but it's not cheap. This is expensive, you know, this is not some sort of solution to austerity and a way of us scientists suddenly being able to collect masses of data this is you know as you'll have seen from your project like this is you know we're not cheap are we <laughs> 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 you know this is expensive work
but yeah, so that was it really. That was really interesting. Yeah. So it's a bit um, different to. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thoroughly compelling. Um, Thank you. Are there any questions? Um, I, I, would, it, I think citizen science is really interesting, but I, I wanted to ask about uh, the contrast between when the agencies want to know the data and they. And, oh, and actually they don't because um, mm -hmm. I've just started, I've been doing recently work on opposition to shale gas extraction, mm -hmm. to, to fracking, and um, there's a big contrast between, um, like for example, in Texas, in Azor, the reason that they worked out that there were earthquakes were because people in Azor all started reporting it to the US Geological Survey, and now there's a ball that <coughs> they, they ask for people every time you feel an earth tremor to mm. fill in this form mm. and their look at it um, and that's partly because the Texas Environmental Regulatory Agency doesn't do any environmental monitoring and there weren't any seismic stations within like 60 mm. miles of this area so actually mm. but then what happened was then it was it was found out but then uh, they brought in a university to do a scientific study so but <coughs> you can contrast that with another area I look at in Pennsylvania where they're training people or NGOs training people to do air quality monitoring and water monitoring because there's so many issues with the environmental consequences of the industry. But in those cases, it's the state or the industry say that these people don't really know how to do this mm. properly and actually they don't have baseline da data mm. about the water quality. And so we can't, you know, we can't use this information. Mm. So I suppose how there's something there about, and actually, even with the Texas case, even when they acknowledge it causes earthquakes, there's now this discourse of, but it's okay to have some earthquakes. It's no. Like, you know, the, but they're acceptable, so we redefine what the risk is. So I suppose it's something there about your reflections on that relationship between what, what we find out and how it might influence what we do, but how that's also very well what we want to do or, or don't. Yeah, it's so difficult. And I think um, it's in a case that sort of I can think of in the UK is sort of around um, noise monitoring around Heathrow. And it's like communities now through technology, you know, on your smartphone, you can look at your noise levels around Heathrow and you can see that actually this is not very good for you. And you can, you know, there's community groups that are forming around this. But what can they do? Like nothing, like as you know, it's not like you can say, "Oh well, I've got the luxury of moving somewhere else." You know, a lot of these communities can't do anything, and I do think it's problematic. And I think so. One of within Opal that we're working on, we're also doing um, air quality. Uh, we've got an air quality survey, so people go and look at um, lichens or lichens on trees, um, and they're really sensitive to air pollution. And which type you've got basically tells you whether you've got clean air or whether you've got polluted air. And I find that quite problematic because, again, what can you do about that? Like, you as an individual could say, do you know what, I'm going to cycle to work instead of drive, but then I'm more exposed to all the pollutants. <laughs> you know, so it is, it is problematic. And I think that, that whoever is commissioning these sorts of things, whether it's the state or whatever, needs to sort of think a little bit about what the consequences are of, of doing that kind of thing. Because a little bit of knowledge... Um, can actually be quite damaging. You know, if you find, if you thought that you were living in a beautifully clean environment and now you realise that you're not, um, that's problematic. Sorry, that, that didn't really answer your question, did it? But um, <laughs> I think, no, I think it's just... It's a re yeah, it's really interesting. And I think that um, there's also... So what you're saying about, you know, they want people to go and collect this data but they don't necessarily have the skills of the baseline or whatever. I mean, there are so many projects out there that are... Doing monitoring, water quality monitoring, even in the you know in the states, massive, massive water quality monitoring campaigns, um, and so I think somehow all of these projects need to be linked up a little bit better. And I was at a really great conference in the states earlier this year about citizen science, um, and we had six hundred practitioners of citizen science come from across the world, um, and all talking about their sorts of projects, and they just all need to be a little bit more communication so that everyone's not reinventing the wheel. And then the state agencies need to kind of come on board and say, OK, well, actually, you're collecting data in this way. That is sufficient for our needs. Or could you modify it slightly? And whilst you're out there, could you use this pH stick or whatever? Do you know what I mean? To collect the data that they need. And I think, again, that's why there needs to be more communication between both the scientists 
and the policymakers and those who need the evidence mm. and the people that they're expecting to go out and collect this data. Mm. So, yeah. And final uh, question from John. Yeah, well, um, I wanted to kind of take what you were talking about and ask you, uh, you guys the question about your project, you know, um, because when Sarah raised all these questions like who decides what the research questions are, whether the motivations of the community researchers, you know, the people who participate in it, what do you get out of it? Like, you know, do you get anything out of it? Are you just doing it for the good of, you know, knowledge or whatever? Um, what happens when the project's over? Like, you know, are there any legacy effects? Does it, you know, what's going to happen next after, you know, this project comes to an end, the British Academy has done its funding, the money's all spent, what are you going to do next and all this? So, it's really, I mean, I'm sorry, it's not a question for no, you, so no. it's a question it's for, a great question. you know, you guys, which is, you know, how, how did this all, how do you relate these questions to what you did? Well, we, some of us are going to keep in touch, of course, yeah. because we've started things and we're going to just continue, yeah. you know, and share, you know, share capacity building, really, the community yeah. capacity building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think for me it was, an extension with my um, knowledge from the community as well, being able to, a professional being able to look at the community. Mm. So like, side of the world as well as you're going to get stuff out, you've got stuff out of this project that is going to help mm. you in the work that you're doing anyway, right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay, yeah. Look, look, is that generally yeah. true of yeah. people that were in the project? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Close. Yeah. Absolutely. Close. Um, back to the experience of Australia and a bit of chatting here, like, and I need to engage a bit more as well. Yeah. Like change, change yeah. attribute practices as well. Not just sit and you know, yeah. or okay, write for the papers and stuff. But also, like, yeah. if you get more involved, perhaps with even local politics or local community um, yeah. projects, and actually do something a bit more practical. I think. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Can I reiterate a question that you started with about how engaged you were with designing the project and the questions that you asked and answered? This is to you as um, Yeah, from the, the project, it's, be, it's been going for about two years, the funding mm -hmm. in the first place wasn't um, mm -hmm. the first lot of funding, not the project back on the time scale wise, but I think that that was a bit of a good thing really because it gave us more time to kind of shape the project from mm -hmm. the start and we had like the Skype meetings and things like that. And mm -hmm. I think the two groups, the Ashton group were uh, quite tightly linked and being able to sit down around Fiona's house, a bottle of wine and <laughs> chew in the fat, you know, um, uh, that would give us opportunities to kind of discuss what we wanted out of the project and where it wanted to go. And I think the, the dynamics, two groups and Matt on his own there, the two groups have got more of a say of what goes on because of that kind yeah. of solidarity yeah. between the groups. So yes. we can, yeah. Awesome about you know. <laughs> <laughs> if, it was, if it was one group working with an academic, I think that would be. Mm. It, it would cause more barriers. I think. Mm. There's an um, importance as well of just what the Aboriginal people call yawning. I think you know we underestimate how important it is just to sit and talk. You know, actually not necessarily do something, but sit and talk and discuss mm. and see you know what position other people, what ideas they've got, mm. uh, where where we come from, just like today, you know, talk about what we're lives. Uh, context of our lives. I think that's really, really important, and I think that's how you start realizing you're, you're not the only one. You know, well, life's, life's can be very isolated in many ways. You know, you, you can go home after work, sit and watch TV, go to work, watch TV, and you know, nothing really happens. Nothing changes. And I think that in itself can lead to apathy. And I think mm -hmm. just repeating the same sort of things and not actually sharing um, ideas and having discussions. So yawning, I think, you know, yeah. another great thing from Australia <laughs> and Irish, of course. <laughs> I, I like the um, what came out there from the beginning. Um, Matt's ideas about um, Matthew's ideas about um, the three three things: um, the solidarity, non-domination, and equality. And I saw that uh, and discussed that with other people, other people in the community too, besides uh, uh, the group. Um, that that's something for the Aboriginal people in their quest for developing their own communities 
uh, sort of looking for, like a, a rule of thumb, you know, a, a sort of guideline. I mean, it, there's culture, there's values, and so on and so on, but because of the nature of our own, own system, like clans, like different autonomous you know, groups, and that's a good thing, but it means that when we're doing something, uh, trying to rebuild and revitalise our own communities, we're all just doing it all in one continent. You know what I mean? Um, in in different ways, from, and and we're not not nobody's looking for a kind of uh, clones of each other. You know, one kind of ideology. Yes, we all we do it all like this and and so on. But yeah, to have a kind of a rule of thumb about well, there's the things that we're attempting here. You know, they satisfy those sorts of things. You know, and somebody else might be doing something quite different. Well, you have a, a rough rule of thumb like that, those three things. You know, I found that really, really interesting. And I know other Aboriginal people f found that really interesting too. Although we do have a thing about equality and balance, as I was talking to you about last night. We say equality straight balance. So, that's right. But I found that really, really helpful and interesting as far as the project goes, but beyond that. Mm. Well, what, sorry, one thing. Can I? Can I? Yeah. Just only one thing, just to do with them. Um, it's not citizenship science, but uh, no. some communities, Aboriginal communities work with science. Mm. Scientists all over the whole country in different, you know, to do with water, mm. things like water quality, yeah, yeah. soil, all sorts of stuff. Do they, do, do, does this system in this country, do they acknowledge those community people? I know you can't acknowledge all millions of people, but um, but just a community here or there? Um, Are they mean, mentioned in the final outcome? Or yeah, so often, yeah. So on those, the Zooniverse people are probably the, the most prolific publishers. So academics, you know, the way that you get recognition is by publishing in, in academic journals. And um, they, they have an appendix, which is all of the contributors. Um, so they'll say, they'll maybe pick out some of the key contributors, so maybe the people who did most classifications or something. Mm. So one of the nice examples that I use is, um, which is a Zooniverse one, is that um, a, school, a Dutch school teacher discovered a totally new kind of galaxy, um, and she called it a Vorwerp, which is Dutch for a weird object. <laughs> and um, it's now called... It's like in astronomical terms, it's an actual thing called Hanny's, she, she was called Hanny, Hanny's Vorwerp. Um, and so she and one of the Zooniverse, the Galaxy Zoo creators have written a paper about it, explaining and describing it and things like that. So yes, I think it's really important to acknowledge, um, acknowledge contributions. And I think that's one of the things that, that um, we're at risk of not doing enough of. Um, so, yeah, so within mm. the projects that I'm working on, we'll all, always acknowledge either by name or if it was, a, you know, if there was anonymous participation. Because some of the communities I was working with, with there was um, issues with if, for example, um, someone was um, getting, um, getting the dole mm. and they weren't fit to work, but they were fit to walk around a site and do a butterfly survey with their dog. You know, there was they were worried that there was going to be repercussions of that if anyone saw that their name was listed on something. So, um, yeah, despite the fact that obviously it's got huge positive mental and physical health benefits for having a walk in a country park with your dog. Um, but yeah, so so yeah, so we will always acknowledge if that's appropriate. Um, but I think again, that's that's what I was saying about the environment agency and not thinking about the feedback to people it's like surely people will just stop doing it if you stop thanking people yes. <laughs> you know people's time is precious if you don't thank them they're just going to give up and do something else so yeah <laughs> all right then uh, thanks for watching thank you <laughs>